So, how to calculate changes in entropy? In this video, I'm going to walk you through a couple of exam questions. In the first one, we're going to look at how to calculate the entropy change of the system, surroundings and total or universal entropy change. And in the second exam question, we're going to look at how we can determine the temperature at which a reaction becomes feasible. So, let's jump straight in. Hydrogen peroxide spontaneously breaks down to form water and oxygen. We've got an equation with state symbols. We have got the enthalpy change for the reaction. That's enthalpy, not entropy. Part A, calculate delta S cis for the reaction using the information in the table below. So we're being asked to calculate the entropy change for the system. And the system is our reaction, hydrogen peroxide breaking down to form water and oxygen. So we should know that in order to calculate the entropy change of the system, it's the sum of the entropy change of the products take away the sum of the entropy of the reactants. And then so we will get the entropy change. So the products in this reaction, and as always, I'm a big favor of setting it out. If I were doing an exam, I would set it out like this with arrows so I know exactly what I'm doing. So if I get lost, I can find my way back through my answer. So the products are water and oxygen. So water, the entropy per mole is 70. And we're going to need half an oxygen. Now, Molar entropies are given per mole. We only need half an oxygen because we're doing this according to the equation as written. So it's going to be plus 0.5 times 205. So that's the total entropy of the products. The entropy of the reactants is just hydrogen peroxide. So that's 110. And when I plug that into my calculator, that comes out to be 62.5 or 63 joules per Kelvin per mole. Now, if I look back, my answer cannot be more precise than the least precise piece of information given to me. And if I look, my enthalpy changes to two significant figures, as is the molar entropy for water. So the correct answer in this case would be 63 joules per Kelvin per mole. Now, sometimes they remind you in the exam questions to quote to an appropriate number of significant figures. But at A-level, generally speaking, you're expected to make that connection and figure it out for yourself. So in part P, we're being asked to calculate the total entropy change for this reaction at 25 degrees C. Sometimes total entropy change is given as entropy change of the universe. These two are completely interchangeable. So first we need our equation. So total entropy change is going to equal the entropy change of the surroundings plus the entropy change of the system. Now, entropy change of the system, we've just worked out, was 63 joules per Kelvin per mole. Entropy change of the surroundings is minus delta H over T. Now, pay close attention, please. If you don't know where these equations come from, if you couldn't explain to your nearest and dearest why delta S surroundings is minus delta H over T, why it's divided by temperature, where the delta H comes from, you need to go back and watch the first video in the entropy series. Because it's all very well just learning the equations they put in textbooks. But if you don't understand where they come from, believe me, in an exam, when they start asking questions about the relevance, um, relevance even, or the significance of what you have calculated, you're going to come unstuck. So please just do not simply learn equations 
and learn where the numbers go. You need to really understand where they come from. So, little lecture aside, minus delta H over T. Well, minus delta H, because entropy is always given in joules, we require our enthalpy also to be in joules per mole. But remember, in the questions, it's always given as kilojoules per mole. So if we go back to our original question, we find that delta H is minus 98 kilojoules per mole. So that is going to be 98,000 joules per mole. So let's work out this first term, minus delta H over T. So it's going to be minus, minus 98,000, divided by the temperature, and the temperature needs to be in Kelvin. Once again, we know this because the units are joules per Kelvin per mole, not joules per degree C per mole. So minus 98,000 divided by temperature, 25 degrees C is 298K. Now, be very clear here. It's the reverse of the enthalpy change. This is an exothermic reaction. So all that energy is going into the surroundings and increasing their entropy. When we plug that into our calculator, it comes out as 328.9 joules per Kelvin per mole. Don't round up until you get to the very end of a calculation. So we'll leave it with all those numbers there. So finally, total entropy change is going to equal 328.9 plus 63, and that comes to 391.9. Once again, we need to quote this to two significant figures. So actually, my final answer would be 390 joules per Kelvin per mole. It's very, very positive. And this is what we'd expect, because if we go back to our original equation, we have a single molecule going to form two, one of which is a gas. So there are far more ways to arrange two molecules than one. And gases have more energy far more ways to distribute the energy. So our system is becoming more random, more disordered. In this second exam question, we're being asked to determine the temperature at which a reaction becomes feasible. This is a very popular A-level exam question. The reaction in question is the decomposition of calcium carbonate. I'm sure you've seen this reaction at GCSE. You take a marble chip and you stick it in the Bunsen burner in your tongs and you heat it and you heat it and you heat it and you heat it and eventually it looks like absolutely nothing's happened because both calcium carbonate and calcium oxide are white solids. However, the calcium carbonate decomposes. So it's an endothermic reaction. We know that also from the information in the question, delta H is plus 178 kilojoules per mole. And it has a positive entropy change for the reaction. Delta S system is plus 161. Again, one molecule breaking down to form two, one of which is a gas. We would expect that to be a positive entropy change. I'm gonna show you two different ways to do this. Firstly, just using entropy changes. Secondly, involving Gibbs free energy. So let's do this the first way. So we know that the total entropy change for our reaction needs to be positive for the reaction to be feasible. So surroundings plus entropy change of the system. So for a reaction to be feasible, this must be positive, or at least it must be zero, because if it's zero, that tells me that our reaction is at equilibrium, um, Kc equals one, um, if you want to put it like that. And that's the temperature or the point in terms of entropy at which the reaction becomes feasible. We know how to calculate entropy change of surroundings, minus delta H over T. And this has been given to us, that's plus one, six, one. So zero, equals minus delta H, so that's minus one, 
seven, eight thousand divided by the temperature. We don't know what the temperature is. That's what we're trying to find out. Plus one, six, one. Remember, delta H needs to be in joules, not kilojoules. Hence, it's 178 um, thousand, not 178. We can rearrange this equation. So minus one, one, six, one. So I've taken that term there over to the left is equal to minus 178,000 divided by temperature, which means that temperature is going to equal minus 178,000 divided by minus 161, and that comes to 1,106 Kelvin, or in degrees C, 833 degrees C which seems absolutely right. That would be the temperature of my marble chip stuck in my Bunsen burner for a few minutes at a time. The second way to determine the temperature at which this reaction becomes feasible is using the expression delta G, so change in Gibbs free energy, equals delta H minus T delta S. In this case, delta S is the entropy change of the system. T stands for temperature, delta H change in enthalpy, and delta G change in Gibbs free energy. Once again, when delta G is zero, that is the minimum um, change in Gibbs free energy we can have for a reaction to become feasible. Delta G is measured in kilojoules per mole. So when we use delta H this time, we don't change it to joules per mole, we would leave it as kilojoules per mole. And then we have all the information that we need. So zero is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Let's rearrange this equation before we start putting the numbers in. I think that makes more sense to me. So I can take the T delta S part of this over to the left-hand side. So T delta S system equals delta H. I can divide through by delta S system. Now, the reason I am taking this right back down to basics, is quite often in the textbook, they just give you the final equation. The final equation being T equals delta H divided by delta S system. But it's important you know how we got there. Delta H is, according to our question, plus 178. We're leaving it in kilojoules per mole. Entropy change of system also needs to be in kilojoules per mole, not joules per Kelvin per mole. So we need to divide by a thousand. So my entropy change of system is going to be plus 0.161. So that's changing it into kilojoules per Kelvin per mole. And when you divide one by the other, we get the answer 1106 Kelvin, which is a bit of a relief. So whichever way you do it, you're going to end up with the same answer. If this has been useful, hit the subscribe button, the effortless way to support your studies. And by clicking the link in the blurb below, it will take you straight to the Crunch Chemistry School, where you'll find all the resources you need to get that A-star grade at A-level. Together we can do this.